Welcome to all of you. I'm going to start saying that this is my first seminar in English, so I apologize in advance for any mistake I will make. <laughs> I would like to thank the CEB for giving me this opportunity. Okay, as I said, this is my first uh, seminar outside Spain. And especially for, for having this, this idea that will help all the coaches to, to grow uh, together. I would like to start uh, talking a little bit about uh, my life, my experiences on, on volleyball and beach volleyball. Okay, so I'm gonna make some memories. This is, uh, I was 18 years old here. I start playing volleyball, indoor volleyball. I would say outdoor volleyball because at that time we didn't have any facility like this. We play on, on concrete. Uh, and I started when I was 14 years old. It was, it was my first time that I have contact with volleyball. And since I started, I was uh, like a, a tall guy. I was uh, strong. And in the beginning, I, I, I felt really comfortable with my partners because I even uh, felt like I was the strongest players in the team. So this is always a very good feeling. When I had this, this age, it, I, here I think it was 17, 18 years old. Which, which one is you? <laughs> this one, number five. Okay. I start going to the national team and then I had the opportunity to meet other players, even stronger and taller than me. So, excuse me? I was playing outside, either. And, uh, well, uh, something changed inside me. I mean, I had not the same confidence as before. You can imagine why. Because it, a few years be before, I was like uh, the non-stoppable player. And when I start going out and playing internationally, then I I start playing with another, another players, as I said, stronger than me. And something was changing inside me. So I, I didn't have the same confidence and, as, as before. Okay. It was a little bit earlier, uh, later, sorry. I'm number 12 there, with no hair. Then uh, I was playing, a, I would say, semi-professional because I, I really, uh, even if I was uh, spending all my time only on, on volleyball, uh, my earnings were not really high. So I, I would not consider this, this kind of life as professional. Okay, but I was doing what I really love. It was play volleyball. Okay, and at this moment I was sharing volleyball and beach volleyball because uh, the first national championship in Spain was in 1991. And uh, for indoor players, we had the opportunity to play indoor uh, volleyball in winter time and uh, beach volleyball in summertime. So I had the, my first contact with beach volleyball in 1991. In this team, you probably recognize one of the best players in the world. This is Rafa Pascual. He, was, he has been the best Spanish player ever. And I also remember some feelings when I was playing here, it's that you can be on the bench, okay? You can be replaceable. And this is something that uh, is not, not really easy to deal with, okay? I'm, I'm telling these things because later on, I will explain why uh, I, I've been focusing my uh, exposition in, in this way and not in another, in different way. Okay, I have to say that this, this year, I had a very, very hard surgery on my right knee. And after that surgery, there was a doctor who told me that I, should, I had to stop playing any kind of sport. It was a really, really hard surgery. But at this moment, I was only thinking on playing beach volleyball. I really love beach volleyball. I really love beach volleyball. It's everything for me at that moment. And I had the surgery, I remember the date, it was April 23rd. I had to stay 40 days without working with the leg like this. I lost eight kilos and the, 
18th June, I was playing my first national tournament. 18, it was almost 40 days after, after that. Okay, I'm gonna show you a picture of that summer. I'm this guy here. Okay, I, I, I was suffering a lot, a lot because my, my knee was all the time, you know, with liquid inside, it was swelling. And, and I, I suffered a lot, of, a lot of pain, a lot of pain. But I, I, lo I really love beach volleyball and I wanted to play beach volleyball. So uh, this, this same year, at the end, uh, I could uh, win the, the Spanish tour with, with my partner, Manolo Berenguel. Okay, you probably recognize this picture. This was the first time that uh, beach volleyball uh, was an uh, Olympic sport. And that's the reason that I, it was in Atlanta, 96, and that's the reason that I could still play uh, uh, professionally in, in the sport that I really loved. And the reason is why, the reason is that in, in 94, I was playing my last indoor uh, session. Because of my knee, I couldn't play anymore. And thanks to the beach, I could still play, and I'm still playing. Today, I play, sometimes I play for fun, but, and, and I play, I like to compete. So, and it's thanks to, to the sand. So many people were saying, no, you, you quit because uh, you need, no, that's not true. Thanks to the, to the sand, thanks to the beach volleyball, I'm still playing, okay? So this uh, was, I remember this moment very, very, <laughs> like it was today because uh, for the first time, uh, beach volleyball became Olympic sport. We played the Olympic qualification. We, we had the opportunity to meet great players like Karsh Kiraya, Sinjin Smith, uh, Ken Steffes, and, and, and many others. Uh, Giorgi from Italy. Well, many, many. And uh, that, was, that was very, very nice to be there for the first time in, in, in Olympic Games. And the result of, after many years of career, was the consecution of, of this medal. But I would say that uh, I have even better moments than, th than this one. This is like, like a recognition of uh, a very long career. But at the end, uh, this moment is passing away. And you have to keep going and you have to, to find new goals, new ways to, to, to have illusion and to, to motivate yourself, okay? Well, there was a moment that I was quitting uh, beach volleyball and I start uh, coaching because even when I was a player, I loved to coach. I was coaching my partners because I had like uh, the last two partners were much younger than me, like uh, 2001, 2002, I played with an, a partner who was, I think, eight years younger than me. And then Pablo Herrera, who's still playing, he was 21 years old when I was 34 playing in the Olympic Games. So I had the opportunity to, to coach them as well. As I was a player and at, at the same time, I, I was a coach. Because when, when I start playing, we had no coaches. Really, there were no coaches. You know, in, in, in this project, in the, in the project of uh, Atlanta, we had a coach, but he came from indoor. He, he, he didn't know anything about beach volleyball. So he was doing all the planning and the, the, the training sessions, but he didn't know anything about the technique or how to play beach volleyball. So we, all of us, we had to, to be uh, self-taught. We have to, to learn uh, from ourselves, from our, uh, skilled uh, from our reps and and try to copy or even learn from other players who were uh, like American or, or Brazilians who were playing and who who had more history in, in, in this sport. In Spain, beach volleyball was, as I said before, uh, was uh, the, the baby of, of, of the sports in Spain. So uh, we didn't have this this lucky that the young players have today. <coughs> they have coaches, they have assistants, they have even friends who can teach them uh, many, many things. 
and not only uh, regarding the, the, the game, the, the, the competition, how to play, tactics, techniques, physically, but mostly, mostly the, 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 the emotional and the psychological part, which is uh, today, I think, is the most important part, the most important part. Okay, I'm going to tell you why. Well, when I, I turned to, to coach, after quitting as a player, I had to change my mentality. Okay, so uh, I was, I had to, to tell myself, I'm not a player anymore, I'm a coach. I have to start thinking as a coach. Okay, this is a big, big and huge step. Okay, there's another thing, uh, comparison. No, other players are not like me. You cannot expect from the other players to do the same as you've been doing. Okay, because they are different. Every player is unique. Okay, our training is different now. Because coaches have to train as well. They have to prepare. They have to learn new things. They have to study. Okay. And what I just said, there are more things apart from technique, physical preparation and statistics. Okay. Important. We have to teach the person before the athlete. Okay. Because if we teach the person, we will have a better athlete. You can be sure of that. I, I'm sure that many of you know that already, or all of you. And of course, we have to be an example. Okay, we cannot ask the players to be on time if we then arrive 15 minutes late. Okay, one of the things that I was worried about and what I've been seeing many times, not only when I was playing, but also with young players is this emotional blockade. Okay, as you can read, it's a psychological barrier that we impose to ourselves, okay? And prevents us from being able to discern clearly in some aspects of life, can be of life or in the game. Okay, as I just said, everyone, at some point in the game of practice will notice this type of psychological blockage. And when this happened, our feeling, it's total loss of control over the situation and about ourselves. Who of you have felt this to be paralyzed when you are playing? Any of you? You? <laughs> the youngest there? Sometimes? Yeah? Okay. I've experienced myself as well. Yeah? And the uh, you see, the emotions are hijacking us and do not let us advance. So that's the reason we are going to talk about emotions right now. So how can we understand young players if we are not able to do that? Because I was young. You were young, but you are not young anymore. And you have changed a lot, the same as me. I've changed a lot. I have the experience, I have uh, knowledge, I have information, but I'm not younger anymore. I don't have the same feelings than younger players. So how can we do that? With empathy and training. You know what empathy is? It's the ability to understand and sense other people's emotions and feelings. And what do, what do I mean with training? That to know that I, I had to train, I had to find the information. Because a few years ago I didn't know. I knew something was there, but I really did, didn't know much about this. So I had to find information. Okay? And this is the information that then you have to, to use to understand the players. And to let them know, because they need to know what's going on inside them when they have, for example, this emotional blockade or any other emotion or feeling. They have to know. Otherwise, how can, we, how can they deal with it? It's really difficult. 
Yeah? And, and that's what I, I was saying before. I remember different feelings when I was young and I didn't know how to deal with them. I was afraid, afraid to be removed, to sit on the bench. Even I was afraid to go into the court when I, when I was in the bench. You can imagine the situation. How is it, this is possible? I was sitting on the bench and I was afraid that the coach called me to get into the court because I was afraid to do wrong. You understand? And this is something that nobody explained to me anything. I just was asking myself, please, please, please don't call me, don't call me. This is a joke. <laughs> but these things happen and still happening today. I'm sure many of the players are there will live the same situation. Okay, as you know, there are emotions and feelings. And what's the difference between emotions and feelings? Well, let me explain. I'm sure you agree with me that we are what we feel, okay? And the emotions drive people. Uh, according to some authors or uh, specialists on, on, on this uh, materia, there are seven basic emotions, okay? Surprise, sadness, fear, disgust, contempt, joy, and anger. But then there are secondary uh, emotions and, and, and feelings. These are some of them, but are many, many. These are two sentences of two persons very known in, in, this, uh, in this field. One of them is Sarah McKay, okay? I'm sure you, you understand the meaning of the sentence. Or we have another specialist, Antonio Damasio, okay? You see that this is very interesting. The order of such event is I'm threatened, experience fear, okay? And then I feel horror. And the most interesting thing here is that we can ask, what's first, emotion or feeling? It can be both ways, okay? Sometimes we have an emotion, like some, someone scares us or there is a car coming and we are scared, we are afraid, okay? And sometimes there is a feeling inside us that turns into emotion, okay? Uh, for example, uh, we can live a situation that uh, we are playing the last point in the set and we are like afraid to receive in the ball and to make the point or not. If we missed that point, the next time you will leave this situation, this feeling will provoke the emotion. You understand? I've seen this and I've lived this. And you know, this is like a, a small a ball that it, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. And you have to stop this as soon as possible because then it's very difficult. You can live all your life with this. You, some of you who play or have been players, you know the situation or maybe you've seen players that we, we in Spain, we say, ah, oh, this player is gonna shit himself at the, at the end of the set. And this is the problem. You know, because he's remembering what happened the last time, that he missed a point. So we have to do something with this, okay? And we can, we can change this. We can help the players, okay? Sometimes feelings are sparked by emotions. And then, plus thoughts, memories, images that have begun subconsciously linked with a particular emotion for anyone, okay? Sometimes feelings are sparked by emotions. And then we have the other way. Just something threatening can trigger an emotional fear response. Okay, because sometimes we, we are talking about fear and fear, fear can be fear to anything, fear to, to lost, fear to, to do a mistake, fear to, to play, even to, to go on, on the court and play. Okay, that's what I, I was telling you before. I was, I was afraid. The coach called me to, to get into the court. 
Okay, this is fear. And we are living with this fear. And we should not. Okay, we can choose. What are your fears? What are you afraid of? What are you scared of? Because we all have fears, don't we? We all have something that's blocking us, that's holding us back. that most people are not living out their true potential and not doing all of the things that they would really like to do is because of fear. Some people call fear false evidence or expectations appearing real. What are the things that you fear that's been keeping you from living your dream? That's been keeping you from doing some things that you would like to do. Let's think about those things. Don't condemn yourself for being afraid. It's perfectly fine to have some fears. You acknowledge your fears, you embrace those fears, and then you move on. You act on whatever it is that you fear. Because once you embrace it, see, what you resist will persist. How do we begin to handle that? Abraham Maslow said that the life is about growth. And he said, you can either go back to your comfort zone, and there you won't find any growth, or you must willing, be willing to go forward and face your fears again and again and again. So what kinds of things, what kinds of thoughts are you feeding your consciousness? What kind of things are you putting in your mind? So deciding as you look at your life, as you look into the future and say, what fears am I holding on to? What fears that I'm allowing to imprison me that's keeping me from breaking out, that's keeping me from living up to my true potential, that's keeping me from really being happy, that's keeping me from having a sense of adventure and excitement in my life. What's, what's keeping me from controlling my destiny? And I'm giving that permission to you. Notice what I said. We must give our permission to fear, to immobilize us. Because whatever discomfort you experience, whatever challenges or difficulty that it is, you've got to have it. I have to go up in there and wrestle. Will it be easy? No. Will it be challenging? Yes. And the majority of the fears that we have are not life or death fears. They're not those kind of fears. But through our imagination, we blow them out of proportion and we give them more power than they actually have or deserve, and we permit them to govern our lives. Okay, in the beginning of humanity, the, the fear had a purpose. It's to, to save our lives. Okay. But today, we have fear for many things, and most of this of these things are this imagine never happen okay we have fear of something that didn't happen yet and the most interesting thing that is this that this thing that never happened is conditioning how we act in this moment you understand Okay, when I'm standing there to receive the last, the match ball, I'm thinking negative. I'm thinking if I lose that point, if I do a mistake. You see how we are working, our mind is working like this for some reason. Instead of watching this as something exciting, I have the opportunity to make the last point. But we do the opposite, the opposite, okay? 
many, many of the fears we have are imagined. Okay? And that's the good, the good thing, that we can change that. If we work on it, we can change that. Okay? I would like to show you another, <laughs> another video. Michael, sorry. Okay. It's from uh, one writer. It's a German writer. And uh, in my search, because I'm always searching and, and trying to to know different authors and specialists, it's Hans Wilhelm. Okay, it's this person uh, has a point of view very interesting about fear. Fear is a huge topic and I'm sure I'm going to make several videos on it. Many people think that fear is the opposite to love. I personally don't agree with that because love is all-inclusive, which means fear is part of love. We can call it an outgrowth of love. And fear is not all bad either. It has, like anything in this reality, a positive and a negative. The positive side of fear, of course, is that it does give us the adrenal rush that we need to get out of danger zones. But basically fear is the assumption that we know for sure what will be best for us and others in the future. Which of course is total madness because who knows what kind of experiences we have to go through and where we have to be. But our ego likes to think it knows and if it doesn't get its way it makes us scared. So now let's look at some simple techniques of how we may be able to turn the negative feeling of fear around and make it positive. We know that fear is a contracting emotion. You know, we get it all tied up in our belly and so on. That's fear, contracting emotion. It begins with a sensation, a feeling in our body. We have got here the sensation. Maybe by something we have heard, we saw, or by a thought. And this sensation triggers off an old fear program in us and we suddenly boom, are drenched in fear and fear takes over our whole body and as we know from the law of attraction that like attracts like so by oozing out all this fear we may actually attract the very thing that we fear like an illness or an accident here the broken foot Fear can be a very paralyzing and terrifying emotion. But if we look at it from a spiritual perspective, we can turn it around and let fear work for us instead of against us. Let's say we have been fearful for a while. We can sit down on a chair for this exercise. This exercise is called focusing and was developed by Dr. Eugene Gendlin. That's a wonderful exercise which I strongly recommend for any kinds of emotion we have which we don't like. Like with any other emotions that we have, oops, the first step is always to acknowledge the emotion of fear in our body. We have to take responsibility for our feeling. We have to own it without judgment or desire for a specific outcome. We close our eyes there, and we carefully explore where in our body the fear is. Where do we feel it? in our tummy, in our shoulders, in our neck. And how does it look? What shape is it? Does it have a color? We do this without judgment for a few minutes, just observing. And now we take some deep breath and breathe into the fear, making it even bigger. We are not afraid of it anymore. We own it and we make it big because we know what we resist will persist. And the next step is to shower that fear with all the love that we are capable of. For another few minutes we give it all the love that we have. In our mind we drench it with love, we soak it. Also very important, we love ourselves for having that emotion of fear. Remember love is an expanding emotion. 
and it can cancel out the contracting emotion of fear. I'm thinking of the old story uh, of the old Quaker woman who was sitting in a meeting and when one of the other Quakers asked her for her opinion she said, I'm sorry but I'm a little deaf. I couldn't hear the question but I do know the answer. The answer is love. And love truly works for everything, including fear. After this initial approach, the fear usually has lost some of or all of its initial power. But now let's look at another perspective of, at the emotion of fear. Did you know that the emotion of fear or the body sensation of fear, fear which I mentioned earlier, here we have got the guy, and there's a body sensation, is identical to the one we have when we are excited. It is only after we have filtered it through our mind, the body sensation will either become an oh no experience or oh yes experience. We either respond with positive or with negative. It's the same energy. A typical example is a ride on a roller coaster. When were you last on a roller coaster? You remember here is the little car and there are two people in it. One is hil hilariously happy and says, this is the greatest experience in the world. And the other one is horrified. This is the most horrible experience in the world. It's the same feeling at different interpretations. Or think about all the people who love to watch horror movies. They do it because of the excitement that fear provides them. The utter thrill. Dr. Fritz Perl says, fear is the excitement without breath. And when you remember to breathe with it, it turns into excitement within seconds. Remember the breathing we did earlier in the focusing exercise? We breathe into it and it becomes excitement. And now we can change our attitude toward fear. We can begin calling our fears adventures. Yes. And then they will, we will enjoy this exciting, stirring sensation. If we love it and accept it, fear will fulfill its true role it has for us. It will propel us forward. It will get us out of our old comfort zones because life begins at the end of our comfort zones. Life is constant change and resisting these changes gives us fear. And the best thing to overcome fear is doing what we fear. And it is much easier when we do it with a sense of adventure. Somebody once said that the letters FEAR, F-E-A-R, stand for feeling excited and ready. So instead of fighting fear, we can actually use it for our growth and benefit. Because this is a very interesting point of view. Okay, these are uh, different ways to deal with, with fear. So, an example here, how to change fear from a something bad to an adventure, okay? As I said before, we are playing in the last points and we can change this, okay? But we have to know, we have to know that we can change. Okay, another very interesting feeling is frustration, okay? This is another thing that you can see, you can see many, many, many times. And there are different expressions of frustration, okay? Uh, well, you see what's the definition of frustration here? But this is the good part of frustration, that if, we, if there is no desire to get something, to achieve a goal, there's no frustration. It means if you don't care, you are not frustrated, but you don't care. And do you want to have players who don't care? Or yourself, you want to live your life, you don't care? I don't, I personally don't. Okay, these are the most uh, uh, the expressions that no normally we, we can see. 
uh, when uh, a person let's let's talk about players okay sadness okay when something is not working we see like, faces very sad blame okay shame anxiety when we get mad when we are angry okay I remember in it was three four years ago in world championships there was one of the players that I was coaching and he was a very strong player and young and suddenly he had the opportunity to participate in the world championship in Poland and in the beginning he was really excited because you know how difficult it is to qualify in a world championship and he without any points because of playing with another one well he could he could participate and after playing the first the second match he played terrible terrible and he was uh, first he was feeling fear i saw him playing and he was really really afraid of playing and after after that became frustration you know what uh, he did after playing his three matches and they lost he was going to the hotel and stayed all the tournament in his room and i was there and, hey you are here for the first time in your life in a world championship and you are not going away and watch games and he said i'm ashamed i don't want anyone see me <laughs> there because i've been ridiculous playing well those situations made me think a lot and that's one of the reasons that i i said i have to do something with this because it's the same player that i had in, in i was training in my town and he was much stronger than he showed the same player but his emotional condition changed everything the same player so how many players you see in these conditions affect affected by their emotional situation that can be anyone can be any of these or the, the ones that we we saw before if we can change this we can have the same person the same player but much positive you know he can give or she can give his or her best you understand that yes <coughs> okay when we are in this situation of frustration it depends on how is our tolerance to this frustration if we are suffering the frustration or we accept that something's going on we have an obstacle and we have to find a solution okay so we have four ways here you know this one internal punishment okay you've seen you have felt this I'm this worthless I suck eh? this is what your player did yes but I see many players doing this many many <laughs> Or it can be explosion. I'm sure I had this when I was player. I had this. Pfft, you cannot imagine. I was this kind of player. I was exploding. And I was exploding not only myself, also to my partner. And the feeling was very bad. After that, you know, I remember very good the feeling after that. And I said, I don't want to be like this. I don't like. I don't like to be like this. So then I, I, I was saying to myself, I have to change something because that feeling is, is, is terrible. Or you have the situation that the resignation, ah, it's impossible, they are better, I can do anything. Okay? But hopefully we have the best one, <laughs> which is creativity. Okay, and it's the search 
for solutions. Okay, we have an obstacle and we have to try to find another way to have to jump this obstacle. Okay, to find a solution. Okay, how can we deal with, with this, with frustration? Well, you know this person here, okay? He said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. <laughs> Okay, that's a very clear example of what we should do when we deal with frustration. And this, do not let frustration become the obstacle, okay? Because frustration can be itself the, the, the obstacle, okay? If you don't try to find the solution. This is another very important feeling it's low self-esteem okay uh, the reason why many players have low self-esteem it depends also on their lives on their families the school <coughs> many many things can affect that one person has low self-esteem okay but we cannot change that, but we can help these persons. It's the tone of this opinion is negative. Okay, and this is very important. Okay. Painful and damaging effect in everyone's life, especially when we are young. Okay. So in one way or another, we have to break this uh, cycle okay and especially coaches have a very important role in this matter because we are evaluating them when we train them and we are comparing them so we have to be careful okay because sometimes we think that we are trying to help them and we are doing the opposite we can do mistakes as coaches but if we know this I'm sure we can try to, to help them instead of doing the, the opposite, okay? So we should notice when they are uh, doing, thinking self-critical, okay? And we have to cut this right away, okay? Because we see the players, you see when you're coaching players, you see when they, they have low self uh, low, low, uh, low self-esteem and when they say well, I can do this is impossible okay and uh, counteract self-criticism by focusing on their skills try to uh, focus on their skills uh, so maintain the self-criticisms away one question have any one of you work with uh, this emotions feelings anything of in this matter with yes and how is your experience with this because i played yeah and i remember all my feelings yeah and now i talk with my speak yes. to my players yeah and explain but did you try to to get more information like because, because I, I just started yeah because i just uh, talk about one part of the emotional but then there is another part, which is what's happening inside their bodies, inside our bodies. You know, we have, we have changes in our bodies, depending on, on the emotion. We have, our bodies are producing some substances, okay? And these substances are, are producing for, for something. They have a, a purpose, okay? So it's, it's interesting, if you have this information, uh, you have to give this to the players as well because at the same time they know what's going on inside them okay just if we do a smile we are producing a substance inside in just doing this okay even it's uh, scientifically scientifically uh, demonstrated that we can change their uh, how we build 
the cellulans, the cells, thanks to some uh, ways of act. It's scientifically demonstrated. Okay, so it's it's important to know all, all these things because as we are going deep, uh, we, we have already a lot of uh, people who have been studying this for many years. And I, I've, I've been working all these years with my players where I lived and I've seen I've seen a, like a radical change, really, in their attitudes. It's different now. It's different how they come, they practice, their relationship is much different because now they have more tools and they understand more things now. Okay, so I really recommend you to give this information, to study, to, to get information because it's, it's so, so interesting. And, and as I said before, you have the same player can be in different ways. Yes. How many? Yes. For example, we have the same problem that eight years ago, when you took one guy 16 years old, the feedbacks that you give six, eight years ago, now at the same age guy, it do sometimes doesn't work. You, know, you must change the way of the feedbacks. Now the guys they are playing with this iPads, everything. Yeah. And they don't react the same like mm -hmm. eight years ago, no? Yeah. I mean, they are 16, again, mm -hmm. after six, six years you have a new guy, yeah. but the reaction is not the same. For example, mm -hmm. now they are more, more selfish, they don't think about, you know, yeah. self, self awareness Like eight years ago it was different, now mm -hmm. it's different, so we must find a way to communicate with them, you know? Because all the external things are affecting how we live, how we are emotionally prepare what we feel so we have to be aware of this as well okay because it, even if you are in one country and or, or another everything is changing but emotions especially basic emotions are the same in every culture in every country but then how these emotions are affected it's different depending on, on where you live or your culture. But you can work. Anyhow, you can work with them. One of the worst things is try to hide emotions because you cannot hide them. You think that you can hide. No, I have fear and I, I'm going to hide deep down. Forget that. One day this will go blow out for sure. Okay, so you have to deal, you have to manage these emotions. And you can change the attitude of the player if, he's, if he knows how to deal with these emotions because he's stronger, he's much stronger. He can think clearly, okay? So what do you, um, what do you tell your, your team that are in the third, third and final set and is 13 all and... Uh... Don't think about anything. Just play. Just play. You have nothing to lose. Yes. You, you, have, you have to say, you have nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. And you have to repeat yourself. You have nothing to lose. Just play. It's positive. Because you have nothing to lose. If you say, if you miss the point, we are going to lose the game. You're pressing him so much. And who can keep this pressure? Not young players, maybe some of them, but not many. So you have to play as, as normal. What's the difference between the first point and the last point? It's the same, it's one point. But, you, but yes, it's the same. But you have to think that it's the same point. When you have this mindset, you win the set. This is very Yes. If you have this mindset, the... Because remember, if you have a negative attitude, you are imagining something that at the end will affect what has never happened yet. So you are changing because of this negative attitude. Okay? Well, uh, I'm going to change subject now. I'm going to talk a little bit about the learning and learning stage. Or, also about uh, time managing 
and then a little bit about technique, okay? Let's say that we have four stages of learning, okay? The first one is this one, that we are not consciously, that we don't know how. For example, when we start playing, we don't know how to touch the ball, but we are not consciously of that, okay? Then we have the next stage, we are consciously, that we don't know how, okay? You know this, this, <laughs> this feeling, you know it, no? I do. <laughs> okay, then we become to be competent and we are consciously that we are competent. We start doing things, but we have to think about it, okay? And at last, this is the ideal, is when we play, we are competent, we control the ball, but we do it without being conscious. Lee. You understand this? This is the ideal when we play. Because we are just playing, but we don't have to think how to play. We just know. We just play. So we can think in, other, in the other team, for example. Okay, which is at the end the, the idea. It's not think what, about what's happening in our court, because we have control about it. We have to think about what's going on in the other court. How can we get points? How can we uh, try to destroy the game of the other team? Time management is a process of organizing and planning how much time you spend, you spend on specific activities. Okay? These are something, some things that you can work with, with, your, with your players. Okay? Make better use of time to do other things. Like, for example, if they are all the time playing with their mobile phones, which is difficult to stop. <laughs> they have no time to do other things, which can be much better for them. But this is something really, this is a big battle for, for us, even for ourselves. Okay? But also, uh, I've seen players who are even uh, 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 very, very, very focused on, on the sport on beach volleyball, and they don't think on anything else. This is, I think this is not good. Because if this is this uh, fail, then your life is going down and you will be frustrated for sure. Okay, so beach volleyball is, has to be a part of your life. But then you have the studies, you have your family, you have your friends, you have other activities. Okay, so try to not let the players just thinking all the day on beach volleyball or any other thing. This is very good. They have to come when they, go, they are going to practice or they are going to play. They can prepare mentally themselves in advance. Okay, it's not like I got in the court and I have to play. You can play in a, you can start working in advance. You can start visualizing uh, good uh, situations, like uh, doing good serves or making points or defense, whatever. You are preparing yourself, okay? Even in, in the practice, it's the same. It's the same. How many times I've seen the players coming to, to the practice and we need 10 minutes or 15 minutes after, before they are ready to, to start the practices because they are not really prepared. And they can do this because they, in, on the way to the practice, they can start working on it. This is also very important. When we are playing, it's how to manage the time and the rhythm when we are on the court. Okay, I'm going to put a few examples. Okay, when we play, we have a very intensive moments. And even in the same rally, we have like moments that we have to slow down. Okay, I call these moments in, in Spain, I call them momentos de calma. It's like uh, calm moments or something like this. I don't know how to translate. You understand? Yes. Momentos de calma. It's like time calm or moment of calm. Okay. Yes, because 
you need these moments, especially when you are going, for example, to set the ball. You cannot get in a rush and, and set the ball. You have to be there and you have to think where and how you are going to set the ball. And maybe even if you play in a win conditions, you have to think even more how the wind is going to affect the ball. So you need this moment, okay, before doing some actions, okay? Or when you're going to hit the ball, the same. You, you, you cannot go every ball and, and just hit any time without thinking on the block and on, 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 on the defense sometimes. You need these moments to, to see on the court, okay? And find out the, uh, the spot. Uh, okay, this is the rhythm and, and the time as well. I mean, uh, normally when we play a set of 20 to 21 points, uh, you know how much time we are really playing? You, you know the average? 25 or 21? 21 points. You mean 40 minutes in the game? Really? Playing, playing. Yeah, Real minutes. game. It's like four minutes. Yes, four minutes. Four minutes. Yeah, yeah. We have. 60 minutes to think about it and sometimes we are playing and we see it seems that we have no time come on 16 minutes but you have to to manage this time you have to know how to manage this time okay it's a lot 16 minutes okay this make them aware of this time of calm very very important really very important Maybe they, they, because they, they are not aware of this, okay? They play like in a rush, yeah? And you have to tell them that they need these very, very short moments to control the ball and to think what they want to, what they are going to do with the ball. You understand this? Okay, and regarding technique, I'm not going to talk about the execution of technique, but as we are all here coaches, or most of us, uh, I find many times the situation that I'm explaining something and there is a player who comes in. But I've seen this, that the professional players or someone told me that, and when I explain something, I try to have my arguments, okay? Why? I do this and always is based on the result okay because I have to prove myself and I have to prove themselves that what I'm explaining is working otherwise what I'm explaining is losing power do you understand this okay so that's the reason there's no single technique when we say the technique there's no one technique. Technique can be different. I've seen players having their own technique and they were really, really good. They were amazing, but I could not use their technique because they were, for example, do you know St. John Smith? He was receiving with this, like this. Or Martin Conde, two of the best players in the world and in their moment. But I cannot defend this because I didn't know how to do it. They were like amazing players, okay? So that's the reason. Some, some techniques work very good for, for certain players, but just for certain players. But normally we have to find the best technique for the rest, okay? And at the end is the result that tell us if the technique is good or not. This is very important because we may have a very good information, probably the best information, but if we don't know how to communicate this to the players, we are missing something in the way, okay? And this happens many times, especially if you are with players probably speaking other languages, it's more common. But even with uh, players speaking the same language, sometimes this happens, okay? Or you know that many times the, the young players, they are not listening <laughs> and you are giving information and they miss something. Many times. Okay, this is also very important. 
it's the role of the coach as an observer, okay? Because you give the information, but you cannot take this information like a, a glass and start drinking. You have to learn about uh, what you are doing and you have to use this information. So someone has to be there observing and try to make corrections. Because when you are working on technique, if the technique is not good, what you are doing is reinforcing what is wrong, what is wrong. Okay, so this is very complicated because until the moment that you realize that you have a very good technique, there's been a way to get that technique from not good technique to a good technique. And in this way, uh, there are moments that we're still doing the technique wrongly. So if we spend much time there, so we are reinforcing this. So it's going to be more difficult to find the, the, the good technique. You understand? Okay. So that's the reason we have to be all the time observing, observing and repeating. Okay. And also this is uh, very good to uh, make them uh, be uh, like uh, better players when they are alone. For example, it's uh, the coach as a helper on their way to find solutions. Sometimes we don't let them to find the solution because we're giving them the solution right away. And sometimes it's very interesting that to help them, even if we know the solution, but try them to work. So they have to get the solution because when they are playing, especially us, we cannot say anything. And also this. If the player is conscious when he practices, especially when he practices, he can correct himself. He can make corrections if he has the information. Okay? If the player is not conscious, he's just... Because when we play, we are not... Most of the time, we are not conscious. We are, we are just playing in automatic mode. Okay, we just play how we know. Okay, you understand? We are not, when we are playing, eh? we, we are competing. We are not thinking, oh, okay, I'm, and now I have to go down. I have to put like this, my hand, my elbow, etc. Okay, this is, we are playing in, in automatic mode. So if, especially when we practice, if we can, uh, uh, we can uh, get that the player is conscious of, on what he's doing, he can make corrections. Okay, I had, for example, I, I told you before that we had no coaches in, in, the, in the beginning, beach volleyball coaches, so we had to do this. Okay, correct ourselves. Okay, well, um, thank you very much. I hope, uh, you understood me and and you got my idea because I, I I was not thinking like this a few years ago I changed many things even the way uh, or different techniques I've changed because in this way of getting better of growing as a coach and learning from others I think that uh, I've been improving myself and at the end the result of this is, is uh, are your players you see how how they act how they how are they like persons how they play okay and this is what uh, can make us happier okay to to see that we are doing a good job at least that we believe that we are doing a good job uh, as I said in the beginning, I would like to <laughs> to join this with you, but also I'm open to any comment, suggestion, idea, whatever. <laughs> because we need to work together. We can all win. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>
that you were a different player than me when you were a player. You, know, hmm. you didn't know all these things about how to manage the internal things. Yeah. And, uh, but the rage explosion, you said you were used to yeah. be, you know, yeah. uh, took you to the silver medal at the Olympics. Maybe you can say... At that moment, yeah. I had more experience and I was more quiet. I had more okay. at that moment. I'm talking when I, when I was younger, yeah, not only in the beginning, even I remember, yeah, even before, before Pablo, uh, I had many, many moments of with different players, with different, and at the end, there's no, there's no sense. You don't go as, to any way acting like this, you know, there's nothing good. Nothing good. You cannot get anything from this kind of uh, reactions. So it doesn't help me. It doesn't help the other. So, but it takes time to, to learn because emotions cannot be easy control. And especially if you don't have the tools or you don't have the information. Now I have the information and even I still have to work with it. But I know that I, I have more control, but before it was, was different. You know, you only learn from your experiences and also from your emotions <laughs> or feelings. So when, when I was acting like that, with this cholera, with this anger, the feeling that I had after that was very bad. And I, I knew that I didn't want that. But you know, when these emotions are coming so strong, they are difficult to stop them, very difficult. But <laughs> working, 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 you know, then experience the age. But also with young players, you can, you can work with this because now you have more and more tools. But, uh, with young players, when they are quite explosive, obviously they are part of a team. How do you manage when one, one of the pair is very explosive and is having an impact on the on the other partner as well? Do you speak to both of them together about the situation? Do you speak to one, the explosive one, by themselves first? How do you, how do you manage that? Both, both. Yeah. To one of them and to both because they are a team. And, you know, when you're playing with uh, your partner, you have a commitment, you have a responsibility. So some things, it's better to work alone, but then you have to also speak to the team, okay? And to let them understand that they are not growing up. They are not improving in this manner, okay? But even sometimes when you, you find this kind of player with, it's more explosive, sometimes you have to even give him time. Okay, because you know when you are in this in this moment, you cannot think clearly, and it's better to even to take him a part of the practice and sit there. And when you calm down, you can come. Hey, but do not never scream or yell to him, because you if you do that, you are showing him that this is the way, and you have to do the opposite. This is not the way. Okay, it doesn't mean that if you are yelling more than me, you are right and I'm wrong. Okay, you have to show that there are other ways and, and they will feel better if they use different ways. Anything else? What? Anyhow, I'm going to be here tonight, tomorrow, so you can come to me and, and talk, or we can talk, and we can share things, okay? Thank you very much.